everybody, and welcome back to WOW 11. We are super excited to bring you this awesome presentation today. So I'm Paige Hattie, the director of Mobius Connect, and welcome to this wonderful session, Leveraging Condition Monitoring Technologies for Business Decisions, presented by Chris Colson of Allied Reliability. So that being said, before we go ahead and get things started, if anybody has any questions for Chris throughout today's webinar, go ahead and drop them in the Q&A panel on your webinar screen. And if we have some time at the end of today's presentation, Chris will be more than happy to answer some questions for you. So that being said, Chris, I think you're there with me, right? I am. Good awesome. How are you? Good, good. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you for having me. Good. We're thrilled to have you. So that being said, Chris, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to pass all the reins over to you. Have a blast and let me know if you need anything. All right. We'll do. Thank you. Yep. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I appreciate the opportunity first to be able to be here and talk about one of the things that I get uh, very excited for. I love talking about condition monitoring. I love talking about reliability. And so I get the opportunity to share my afternoon with you and do that. Up on the screen, and though it's kind of tough to see, I'll give you a little bit of background. I'm sure these slides will be available afterwards. Uh, I've been with Allied for about 18 years. Or actually, this is going on year number 18. And I've been able to work across many different uh, business units within Allied and, and work with our customers across many different industry verticals over that 18 years. So today I'm uh, I'm serving in the role of a BU director for our reliability solutions group, which means basically I get to work with all the, our, our team members in the field of delivering our products and services to our customers and be able to inter interact and interface directly with our customers. So it's, uh, it's what I get excited to do every single week is go on site and spend time with uh, with our customers dealing with the problems and helping them with their problems and issues and making it better. Uh, so I've um, a little bit about my background. I, I'm an electrical engineer. I've spent um, about 14, uh, 15 years in the field uh, working as an electrical or uh, working for, excuse me, an electrical and mechanical uh, contractor. And that's how I kind of kind of came across Allied and then uh, started with them 18 years ago. I um, I work with uh, a, a number of, of different uh, associations, such as like um, the Society of Maintenance and Reliability uh, Professionals. Uh, I get the opportunity to also work on a number of different committees with their, their group, as well as the Association of Energy Engineers and work with uh, some of the committees that they have within, within that organization as well. I also uh, sit on the uh, Sustainability Forum of the Reliability Leadership Forum, which I'm, I'm excited to have the opportunity to do that for the last couple of years. As many of you uh, interact with me, you get, you get uh, to be exposed to the fact that not only am I excited about and inter in interested in reliability, but I'm interested in what we can do from a reliability standpoint that drives sustainability across an organization. And that's sustainability across whether it's people, processes, um, or even our products and services that we're delivering and how we can make uh, this world a much better place uh, for those that we leave it to. So with that, let me get into the subject for today and I'll advance the slide. The title for today's webinar is Leveraging Condition Monitoring Technologies for Business Decisions. Now, condition monitoring it plays an integral role in supporting manufacturing and industrial businesses. And, and it's long been used in maintenance to, to help us provide meaningful information to our operational business as to the current condition or the health of our assets and, and our equipment that we, that we operate and that we maintain. The equipment that is instrumental in delivering whatever product our business provides. And it's, it's one thing to provide this information to describe what, what I would say and, and even prescribe the necessary corrective work, right? We identify defects and then we say, hey, we need, to, we need to improve in this area. We need to do this corrective work. That's one thing. But in today's rapid environment, we must be able to provide this information sooner and with higher levels of, of precision and accuracy to that information while at the same time being able to adjust our approach and priorities based on the rapid changing business landscape and economic headwinds. Let me give you an example. Something like um, maybe, maybe the business demand 
or the market has shifted for your particular product and it's become a, a hot seller. And all of a sudden you need to kind of shift your product mix within the operational line and you need to put more focus on additional types of equipment or raw materials that are needed. And because of that, you need to be able to shift your strategy around maintaining and operating those assets. And we've got to be able to do that with our condition monitoring programs as well. I think these are, are the bigger strategic items that I've had the pleasure of thinking through and navigating with, with my colleagues and customers at Allied Reliability. Allied's been around the condition monitoring business since 1996. And, and we've played what I think to be a, a pretty big part in helping define and advance the service of condition monitoring. Now today, I wanna, I'm wanna i going to share a little bit with you here in the next 30 to 40 minutes of, of some of the more recent features that we've developed and deployed within our smart CBM ecosystem to assist our customers in raising the bar of their CBM programs to a level that provides insights to rapidly make critical business decisions. Because ultimately, that's what we wanna be able to do. Again, not just simply identify defects and get really good at identifying and, and making those defects um, visually appealing to the, to the eye when we present them, but we want them to be meaningful and we want them to truly help drive critical business decisions. Okay, so when I think about this idea or this phrase, insight to execution, it's something that that resonated quite a bit with many of us, um, myself included, when we started using and hearing this phrase, I would say it's probably five to seven years ago when it became a pretty, pretty commonly used phrase. Many associate this phrase with even terms like AI and ML, right? And, and for most organizations, AI is far from a golden ticket. And what I mean by that is that the, the rapid transformation that AI fuels has also brought new challenges. According to a, a recent study by McKinsey, more than 75% of enterprises have piloted some form of AI, yet less than 15% have realized a meaningful and scalable impact. And I think uh, there's a good chance that many of you that are, that are listening in here this afternoon or watching this later, you might fall into the realm of, of that 75% that have at least piloted some form of AI or ML, and then maybe only 15% have actually reaped some sort of meaningful, scalable impact. And when I think about uh, insights of execution, I try to, to advance my thinking forward it just a little bit in time frame in the future and ask myself a simple question. What value can be achieved from the execution that these insights have provided or will provide, right? So again, what value can be achieved from the execution that these insights have provided? This question has been, I think, extremely helpful in not only providing validity to the insight that we've presented, but in guiding resource allocation and the level of effort. It also helps months later when realizing the ROI for those insights. Some uh, of those insights are shown here below at the bottom of this slide. And these are some of the values that we've helped delivered when we've deployed that, that uh, holistic condition monitoring program and really focused in on what are the, what are the meaningful business uh, decisions that, can be, uh, that, can, that should be made based upon the, the insights that we're actually able to uncover because of these things that we've been able to find. So let me dig into a few of these things with you. Um, carrying everything that I just said to you about insights to execution, carrying that thought forward and applying that towards condition monitoring program, you should see actionable maintenance-based insights regarding the equipment driving your operations. Now, some of the top level insights that you should receive from your CBM program should be driving overall business and decisions that improve things like safety, uh, downtime, and, and throughput. Now, when, when I work with our clients, I encourage them to make sure that they and their teams understand the, the depth of the information at their fingertips because there is so much data. But really, what's the data telling you? What's the information behind the data or the story? behind the data. They, they should fully expect to be able to view and receive information such as some of these things that you see listed at the bottom of the slide. 
um, holistic asset health performance. So it's it's not just one technology or one form of maintenance that's being deployed. It's no different than us going to the going to see our doctor on our annual routine checkup. And when we go to to that checkup, um, we only get back a, a a partial view of what our health is. Nobody wants that. Everybody wants if you've taken a whole clean slate of of, of tests, you want to be able to see the results of all those tests and what does all of that tell you ultimately about your individual health. That's what we want for the equipment that we're maintaining and that we're operating in the site. Um, another thing that, that I, I, I strive with, with all of our customers to make sure that they're receiving and getting, again, whether they're doing business with us or whether they're running their own program, they should be able to see area, site, and enterprise level metrics. That means if I want to focus in on what's going on within the mixing area of this plant, I can have a level of metrics related to my CM program and my reliability program um, at that level of the organization, all the way up to the entire site or at the enterprise level so that I can drive and learn from findings and drive better decisions upon those findings across all of my assets that that might apply to. Another one is the, the health of our connected infrastructure platform. So if you've deployed some sort of connected uh, platform or sensors, as um, many have done over the last few years, you ought to uh, be able to take a look at some dashboard that shows you what the health of that connected platform is. I'll touch on that here in a little bit, uh, in a little bit more depth here, here in just a second. And then last thing that's listed here is, is something that's actually shown over on the right-hand side of the slide. And that's an email notification where it gives you some immediate and meaningful notification. Just getting a notification saying, hey, there's a problem or we've exceeded an alarm. That's not good enough. What we want to be able to do is if you receive one of those email notifications at, let's just say, 1030 and you're not at the office, instead you're, you're getting ready to uh, wind down for the evening and you get a notification on one of your critical assets that it's gotten into alarm and that's all you see is that it's in an alarm state. It causes a sense of panic, one, a, a sense of panic that almost it, it takes a, a very skilled individual to be able to sit back and be relaxed at that point in time. Instead, we kind of ramp up a little bit when we're, we're, when we're trying to ramp down for the evening. And so what we want to do is be able to provide some immediate and a meaningful notification that gives you some trends of what the data looks like, what we believe might be the might be the issue with the, some first pass analysis that goes on behind the scenes and then letting you know that we're aware of it and we're taking a deeper dive to give you uh, more of the meaningful information that you need to make the better uh, responsive corrective action. All right, so I accidentally skipped ahead here and uh, and I got this slide shown just a second ago, but what I wanted to articulate here is that the Allied Smart CBM platform and the ecosystem, it works for both the traditional manual route collection support model to the more recently added connected model that many people have deployed over the last several years. And so really in a nutshell, what that means is that there's an ecosystem or one platform that's driving the metrics of our CM program that is telling us how we look uh, or how our assets, what the health of our assets are, regardless of how we collect and analyze the data. We have one platform and that platform works well for both of those models. And so that's what we've tried to deploy. And I think that, that I've seen others that uh, have, have, have pushed forward in that type of direction as well with their program. But that's a, that's a point that should not be overlooked. You want to make sure, again, that we have one system so that all that data can be viewed across that system, regardless of how it's collected and certainly regardless of how it's analyzed. So there's a number of you that might be on this, uh, on this call today in this webinar and have joined me. Some of you that may know me and some of you that may use uh, our products today. Some that maybe perhaps never have. But you may be wondering what some of these new features are that we've incorporated into the Smart CBM ecosystem to help provide more meaningful insights. And again, those insights that help us make better business decisions, not just simply fix uh, problematic pieces of equipment or repair uh, defects that we've identified, but actually help us make more meaningful 
business decisions, and that might be altering our maintenance strategy. Well, I'm going to spend some of the rest of our time this afternoon walking you through a, a few of the ones that we're seeing help bridge the gap between maintenance operations and leadership, enabling them, again, to make better overall business decisions. The first one is the connected infrastructure monitoring. This is one that I, I mentioned uh, a little bit ago, and I said I'd talk, to, talk a little bit more detail about it here in just a second. So what you'll see off to the right is, is, a, um, is a dashboard that's live, just like our, our asset dashboard would be. And this one in particular is looking at the overall health of the connected infrastructure. So many people over the last several years have gone out and they've taken um, some form of either a, a wireless or a wired sensor and across multiple different uh, technologies. It could be that we're measuring temperatures or pressures, or we could be measuring things like uh, vibration or infrared, uh, or, or even looking at, at uh, current signature analysis. We take that data and we put a connected point back to the overall um, platform that is pulling data. Right. So we're not going out and, and manually collecting the data. Rather, we're using these connected sensors to do that. When we've added this additional hardware and software, because there's a component of both here, uh, when we've added that, we've also included and added a number of different failure modes. Things can happen to that additional hardware. Um, you could have a sensor that gets damaged or gets knocked over uh, or, or gets banged on and, and, and destroyed. Uh, you could have a, a battery that goes low or even is is dead if you have a wireless sensor. Uh, you could have gateways that go offline from time to time. And then when they go offline, perhaps they don't come back online when they should. Or they have a bad firmware version that hasn't been updated. And so all of that plays into added failure modes. And when you have those added failure modes, the sense of security that we thought that we were installing by having a connected infrastructure, that's gone away because we now are dealing with these failure modes from the actual connected infrastructure, which really doesn't have anything to do with the equipment that's running uh, in our process that's driving the productivity that we need to be um, a good, successful company. And so these added failure modes cause more stress. We need to be able to monitor those failure modes. We need to be able to respond to those. And we need to be able to address them when they come up and know the risks that are associated with each one of them. So that is one of the things that's been built into the smart CBM ecosystem. It's able to identify any offline problematic uh, gateways, um, damaged or dislodged sensors. Sometimes a sensor will still give us data but because of the way that the waveform looks, we can tell you that it's because it's been dislodged or been uh, now it's, it's no longer uh, mounted correctly because the waveform has shifted and not giving us good, meaningful information that can drive, again, the, the fault identification that we want for the piece of equipment that it's installed on. The other thing is, I mentioned to you, low and dead batteries. We also, in this dashboard, we're trending all of those problems, all of those new added failure modes, and we're able to display it in far more meaningful manner to get those things addressed as early as possible. Let me go to the next feature that we've added over the course of the last several uh, months. This feature is uh, titled uh, Guided Analysis, or it's called Guided Analysis. The Smart CBM Analyst Dashboard is one element of this, uh, and that's not actually depicted here, but when our analyst logs in, they can go to the analyst dashboard, and it's going to provide a listing of all open anomalies that require further analysis. It's a very quick and easy click of a button to get to that level, and it shows them all of those anomalies that require further analysis, investigation, and fault entry reporting. This, in essence, is our automated first pass analysis that ensures our analysts hit the ground running, looking at only the problems. It narrows that field of place, so to speak, for engineers and analysts. Many of us, and I'm, I, I say that as an engineer, if you give me data, I'm going to want to look at it. I find it interesting. Whether it's good or bad data, I can almost always spend time looking at the data because of, of the fact that I find it interesting. 
Well, when it comes to condition monitoring and we have fewer resources and more things that are being monitored, we need to try to take some of that time and, and really focus it on the actual problems that we're seeing in the data instead of looking at all of that data. So we're using statistical alarm sets and smart algorithms to enable this first pass and it has provided significant efficiency when it comes to the analysis side of, of uh, condition monitoring. The next element of that is guided analysis itself. So what happens is once our analyst opens up that, uh, that interesting set of data that has exceeded some of the alarms, they'll go in and, and take a look at the actual raw waveform data. They'll open up their uh, fault entry uh, format to be able to, to begin to uh, write that fault entry. And it's going to give them, based on the data that it's seeing in the waveforms, possible failure modes for the selected component that it's being that it's uh, actually collected data on and then it starts to identify and give them a list of the characteristics that are used to identify these potential failure modes for that component now once the analyst has this in front of them they then will review the data surrounding the issue and as the analyst reviews this data they may uh, select the observed characteristics. Maybe they're looking at two time uh, uh, RPM and it's the elevated noise floor. Uh, possible failure modes are, are selected based on the identified characteristics of what they see. And then the, the analysis, along with the analyst that's now looking at it, it decides which failure modes to include and, the, and text for the assessment is generated for the analyst to actually review it and to edit it, maybe make modifications to it. But it's a much faster, quicker way of doing, using the algorithms that have been built, using the failure modes that have already been defined and, and put into a library to drive a more tailored and, and more accurate uh, fault entry and repair recommendation for our customers. The end result is uh, consistent analysis and instructions across all analysts, across all plants. We really leverage the, the knowledge base that has been built. So another feature that, that uh, we've, we've been working on and, and, and have developed and deployed, a company that depends on its assets, they generally use ERP and EAM or CMMS systems. ERP systems are best suited to manage financials while an EAM system manages physical assets. So effectively integrating your condition monitoring program with these systems enables organizations to put their assets, um, their asset management capabilities to greater use and ultimately to improve their productivity and their bottom lines. So don't be overwhelmed by this. It's, it really isn't something that should be overwhelming. I will tell you that for many years, uh, many folks that were running and managing their condition monitoring programs, they were doing this manually meaning if they had a, a platform such as uh, smart CBM ecosystem, they would be doing all the analysis and reporting there. And then they would copy and paste from there into their EAM or, CA or ERP or CMMS system to generate a work order. There was a lot of duplicating effort in those two systems, but that's how they would do it. Now, again, I say don't be overwhelmed by this because we encourage our clients to focus on three primary areas of integration. These three provided, or when we focus on those three, they provide the greatest return on investment for the level of effort, simply in productivity gains. And I'll explain that here as, we, as, I, as I walk through these. The first one is just simply synchronizing the asset hierarchy within your EAM or CMMS with your condition monitoring platform. We need to make sure that we have the right functional locations for all of the assets that we're looking at and that we're monitoring or that we have some program deployed against. And the reason that's important is because if we're going to write a condition work uh, or a, sorry, a condition fault entry against that asset and we want to make a, a repair recommendation that ultimately gets turned into a work order, then we want to make sure that that is done automatically and it's done against that same uh, asset. Also, if you uninstall an asset from a physical functional location, you want to be able to track that asset if it gets installed somewhere else. And that way your historical information can go along with it. So that's number one. 
That's number one. Number two, the second thing to focus on is automating that work request creation and closeout. That's huge from a uh, time saving perspective. Having anybody do dual entry or even if it's just simply copy and paste and it's five steps to create a work order. We want to be able to create that fault entry right where the or sorry, that work order request right where the fault entry is created, right within that platform where we have the data in front of us. We want to be able to close that out. And as soon as it's closed out, we have a, an immediate work order initiation that's done across those two platforms. Today, with the inventions of, of, uh, of, of APIs between uh, CMMS and EAM systems and, and the smart CBM ecosystem, that can easily be handled and done, saving us a, a tremendous amount of, of time so that, again, our analysts can focus on analyzing the data where we have defects. And then number two, step away from the analysis part and engage in reliability engineering, doing things like root cause analysis, uh, tracking all of the action items from RCAs and, and, and bad actor analysis, making sure that we're eliminating those problems so that we don't see those, uh, those defects in the future. And then the last thing is work order history. And it really plays into the last piece that I was talking about is that when we're able to pull over all the work orders that have been done against that particular asset that we happen to have a high level of, of maybe it's vibration on the asset that we're monitoring. And so we take the condition monitoring data and we look at all of the work orders that have been done and initiated over the past, let's say for in this example, over the past 12 months. And we're looking at those work orders and we're comparing it to the data that we're seeing from a vibration analysis perspective, it gives our analysts better insight into what might be going on and what the, what the site is, has perhaps done in the field that might have impacted and caused some of the things that they're seeing from the, uh, from the waveform data that they're evaluating. We do this to help us uh, better understand overall machine health and help drive uh, maintenance costs, but more importantly, having that holistic view of what's going on at the asset level will enable us to help better drive the right corrective actions and the right uh, RCA preventative uh, measures to be able to eliminate those in the, and make them to where they're no longer uh, things that pop up and, and cause uh, issues within the plant and ultimately lead to downtime. All right, so another uh, piece that we've added in is third-party integration. Allied has deployed built-in APIs or application programming interfaces so that our customers can easily connect all their meaningful test data in one ecosystem to leverage the vast array of relational information between all of those tests. Now, it's when we have equipped our trained and skilled subject matter experts with all of this meaningful and relational data that the insights become fully enriched. And that's what everybody wants. They want a complete picture. Uh, we don't just want a, a, a sampling of it or, or, you know, I know that we're deploying multiple technologies and in this platform, we report two or three of them. And then we get over here and we've got this lab uh, analysis that comes to us. No, everybody wants all of that in one view so that it can be very efficient. We no longer receive recommendations when we have the fully enriched data that are simply check other sources for information. No, instead we get direct and prescriptive corrective repair recommendations, which is exactly what anybody that is managing or investing in a condition monitoring program, that's what they're after. That's what they want. All right, let me share with you another one that I'm, I'm super excited about. We're about to release this one. We've been working on it here for the last few months. And this is called the Business Risk Index. I love this one because it really plays directly to the title of, of this particular webinar. Business Risk Index. Our goal with, with our, our new Risk Index is to allow customers to drive and prioritize actions to minimize the risks across monitored assets and all the assets that they're monitoring. Let me, let me describe a couple types of risk for you and, and maybe by describing these risks for you, it'll, it'll uh, explain why I think this is going to be very valuable and important. The first one is risk due to identified faults. That is identified components risk due to known faults. So we've identified this, this failure. We know it exists. We've, we've tracked it. We've measured it. 
that defect is still there and we see it progressing on the P to F curve. We're measuring this known risk and it helps us with prioritization and urgency of repairs to address the identified issues. This known risk index calculation combines criticality, fault severity, and days since the fault has a, was identified to derive a risk index value. So it kind of measures the progression in a form of risk and presents that information back to the business leaders so that they can make better decisions on known identified defects. Let me give you another example. This one on maybe something like miscollections. This is when we identify component risk due to the fact that we've missed data collection, whether it's route-based data collection or whether it's sensor-based data collection, it was missed. And because it was missed, it's a bit unknown. We no longer know what the degradation of that defect is or if there even is a defect because we haven't collected that data. Now, the state of the health of monitored assets, it's unknown. And this risk index can help us decide when it's appropriate to plan countermeasures to gather such data. The unknown risk um, index calculation combines uh, criticality along with um, the amount of time without an assessment of asset health. And when it looks at those two uh, values, as well as whether that asset was previously collected uh, and then missed, and the last time that it was collected, it had a defect. So it looks at all of those things. And again, it gives us a risk index factor. Now, now both of these described risk index values, they help us make far better business decisions by providing timely risk-based enriched actionable data insights while removing subjectivity. I think that's, that's super critical because again, remember one of the things that I mentioned to you earlier at the very beginning, if demands, business demands shift and a product that wasn't necessarily a product that was, that was uh, in a sold out state becomes a product of high demand and you now find yourself in a sold out state for that product, you're going to make business decisions and you're going to shift uh, things within your process so that you can get more of those products out the door and ready to be able to, to sell. And when you, we do that, we shift the constraints and the demands on the particular pieces of equipment or the assets that we're monitoring or maybe perhaps not monitoring. We want to know that and we want to be able to shift the criticality of those assets that are now way more critical to us. When we shift the criticality, because these risk index factors are, well, that's one of the, the uh, elements of being able to calculate that risk index factor is the criticality value. When it shifts, so does our risk factor and our risk index factor. So again, super excited to be able to, to announce this one, to get it into the product, and then to be able to work with our customers while they, while they use this to make better decisions uh, and, and, and use that uh, risk-based and rich actionable data insights. And then last but not least, and certainly um, one of the, the areas that, that um, I've enjoyed working with our team on, and that is uh, we continue to bring enriched and enhanced features to this smart CBM ecosystem that are deployed natively across an array of hardware and software devices. We know that there's a, a lot of different hardware platforms that are used, a lot of different mobile devices that are used. And this idea that we have it, it was to provide these data insights wherever the workforce may be, from web-based GUI interfaces to plant floor and, and break room dashboards to phones and tablets, so that the data can be wherever you are and you can have easy access to it. And so that when you go and view that data, whether it's on your phone or again on a, on a uh, plant dashboard, it's, it's made for that device. It's natively developed and designed and deployed for that device. And that's important because when we look at the data and it, it's not appealing or it doesn't, or it's, or it's hard to use or cumbersome, we just simply quit using it. And so we've spent a lot of time and effort making sure that Within the smart CBM ecosystem, we've deployed it in, in for a vast array of these devices. Now, our workforce has, has come to expect an always-on and always-available environment. 
um, maybe to to uh, some of our liking and maybe not to, to others. But our operations, what I've seen is that they, they've taken pride in, in the work that they have and done and the work that they do each and every day. And ultimately, they become owners of the assets because now people are, are getting far more data about the assets. They begin to take a little bit more care and attention towards those assets. What was defined as a great CM program yesterday has evolved and it requires far more than it once did. Uh, I think gone are the days of, of simply identifying a defect. Today, we must leverage the information and balance it against the business needs of the day to prescriptively define the actions that are required from our condition monitoring programs. Well, I, I appreciate again your time for joining me today. I'm going to open it up for any questions that might have come in or anybody that's got a question can toss those out at this point in time. All right. Awesome. Thank you, Chris, so much for that great presentation. So like Chris mentioned, everybody, we're going to go ahead and open it up for the Q&A session now. So if anybody has any questions and you haven't already submitted them, go ahead and do so now in the question panel on your webinar screen. And again, just as a reminder, your questions will be asked on the air anonymously, so no need to worry about getting called out directly. And if we happen to run out of time and don't make it to your question, no worries. We'll share them all with Chris, and he'll circle back with you once the webinar is completed. So that being said, Chris, our first question up here asks, how do you prevent work order duplicates at CMMS when a single condition is persistent in an asset? Yeah, so that's great. So I'll tell you kind of what we've done. Um, we have this thing that's um, in essence uh, called uh, continued fault entry. And in a continued fault entry, what that means is we've identified and we've seen that that defect is still present. And we go back and look and historically, let's say you were collecting data once, a, once every 30 days and nothing got done. A work order was not, maybe it was generated but it was not completed. What we would typically do in the, in the days of old where it's manual route collection and we're not integrated with the CMMS system, we would open up the uh, fault entry. We know what the initial uh, work order uh, number is because we've done the request and we typically follow through each of those if we have an analyst and we validate, is that work order in queue? Has it been completed? If it hasn't been completed, we will go back and actually do a, uh, with the planner, we will send a an updated fault entry and tell it that it's a continued fault entry against that open work order. Now, in today's environment where you integrate those systems, we actually have code that does that everything that I just described to you, but it does it automatically. So we again have tracked the initial fault entry. We know the the associated work order, and then if that can if that fault entry is a continued fault entry. Again, we are collecting data multiple times a day. That can happen for sure. Then we're going to look at, does it is it already open and, in, and was there already a work order created? If those two things are met, then we don't duplicate that work entry. If they aren't met and there wasn't a work entry, but a continued fault entry, right? Or, sorry, there wasn't a work order uh, generated and another fault entry or continued fault entry is there, then that's going to flag it for a, a system administrator to take a look with the planner to make sure that uh, something wasn't missed because it should have been created. All right, great, thanks, Chris. All right, so our next question up here, and I maybe missing a word or two, Chris, so maybe you can help me with it. If not, we may ask this person for a little bit more clarification. So this next person is asking, what if I have no sensor or route in place does a blind spot factor into the risk index? That is beautiful. I love it. Yes, it does. It does. And I know exactly what they mean by that because I've been working with our team on this, on this particular uh, item. So, um, you know, we are, I'll just give you a, a little bit of my thoughts about this and then I'll stop. But the, but the short answer to you is yes, we've taken that into fact into consideration with the risk index because we know this, we know that many times when we deploy a condition monitoring program, and especially at the early onset, we don't 
have the ability in most cases or because of funding and resources we don't have the ability to to do as much as we'd like to do meaning deploy all of the technologies across all of the potential failure modes that they could identify we have some sort of restraints and we have to balance some risk with reward and so what we typically do is we'll deploy that across a certain percentage of our critical assets and we may take what we we would split it into maybe uh different quartile coverages based on criticality and we would deploy in that fashion and and when we do that we know that there's some potential failure modes that if we don't write a, a a preventative maintenance task or we don't have a let's say an operator care task to go out and, and identify that that defect that we're likely at risk um and then we also know that even if we do deploy that because they're time-based there's a certain level of risk that is added by not deploying a technology that would be uh picking it up much sooner and that that onset of defect much sooner and because of that, we put in a, a, a calculation in the, in the known and unknown risks that addresses just that. Which ones have technology deployed and which ones have not deployed the technology based off of what uh, the failure mode library would show us. So, um, again, great question. And, uh, and I love uh, the fact that you caught on to that because that tells me that uh, it, it, it piqued some interest. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Okay. So you're going to find the next question uh, just ironic with the timing because nobody else in the audience knows this, but Chris and I, before we got on the air, we were talking about the picture and his background because to me, it didn't even look real. It looked so cool that it didn't look real. So one of the first questions that we actually got submitted, Chris, was about your background and somebody was inquiring about the artwork behind you. So would you mind sharing and elaborating a little bit more? <laughs> yeah, sure. So, so look, uh, when we went, uh, when when all of us went through what we did in in uh, during COVID, uh, many of us didn't travel. And I use uh, pre COVID, I, I was traveling every single week, um, and I was always on the road, and I didn't do a whole lot of of uh, video conference calls. And I am in my in my home office. I'm not traveling this week. Uh, and in my home office, behind my desk, I, I basically have a, a have a finished uh, separated pole barn from my house, and I have a living quarters in that, which is my office. And I decided long ago uh, during COVID that I would rotate pictures that were behind me. So actually, where you can't see is three or four other pictures that um, that I think kind of they describe kind of me or the or industry that I've been able to work in. This is an old steel mill and uh, it's a I thought it was a really cool picture. I put it up here about six to nine months ago and I'm almost at time to, to swap it out and put something else up. I've got a nice electrical one that's more in in the realm of my background um, that I'm looking forward to changing and putting up here. But I appreciate uh, you taking note of that. And sometimes we just get tired of seeing all the same fake ones. We think we're in the same office building when we're not, right? <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Oh, my goodness. I love it. That's awesome. I love the background, too. Um, so moving on here, keep the questions coming, guys. We've got a few more minutes. Uh, so the next question up. So this person's asking, how do you assign or determine the weightages of the input parameters that feed into the health index? And then they're saying, is there risk index based solely on the route measurement location data. Okay, so let me break that down in, in, in a couple different questions and I may have you repeat or refresh it or yeah. refresh my memory after I answer the first one. So um, we look at first and foremost, um, the total the total number of, of assets that an op that a organization is um, operating, right? And then we, based upon the total number, we get an asset hierarchy that kind of breaks it out in components and parts. Each of those we know um, because of the, the nature in which they've, they, they are run. Um, and we, we know that they have some inherent failure modes. And those inherent failure modes, if they are best identified or can only be identified by certain strategies, we put a, a skilled factor against each of those. We then look at criticality. Um, 
if you don't have criticality, we're going to tell you you need to get it because it's extremely important. Again, to help us make better overall business decisions, we really need to have a formalized criticality. So criticality is also one of those um, one of those parameters that we use to calculate. From from there, we we do uh, look at the frequency of failures and, and historical failures, and we use an element of that to weight against. Uh, your overall uh, assets that are currently being monitored versus the assets that are not being monitored. And that changes the risk because if we're not monitoring those, we have a higher risk than the ones that we are monitoring and that we've been effectively able to identify defects previously. So it's a, it's a rather dynamic uh, factor. Uh, it, it took us longer to work. I mean, in all fairness, we, we thought we were going to release it back in March because we've been working on it for quite some time. And um, we threw a little bit of wrinkle into it when we deployed and, and tested against some data. We had to go back and make some revisions and we didn't want to release it until we were, we were uh, very sure on the, on the format that we were using that's going to help us uh, take that first journey out. So again, it's, it's due out here within the next week and uh, we're excited to get it out. Um, the last part of that question, I'm not sure that I addressed. So Paige, can you tell me what that was one more time? Yeah, of course. So the last part asks, is the risk index based solely on the route measurement location data? Yeah, so uh, it, it, uh, it does not. Um, and again, I think, I think I may have answered that um, and, and didn't realize it, but it's not just simply the, the route based data. So we are, we are looking at the overall maintenance strategy. So once I, again, know what equipment, I'm going to compare it against what a design strategy should be, what's truly deployed. So is it a maintenance task? Is it one that's done quarterly? Is it one that's done monthly? Is it one that's done annually? Each one of those has a, has a different risk, right? Because progression of failure and the frequency at which I, I do some sort of task, again, whether it's CBM related or PM related all of those pieces kind of play into what we're trying to drive with that risk index factor. All right. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, all right. Yeah. So it looks like those were all the questions that we got for now. So Chris, anything else that you would like to add before we wrap things up for today? Uh, the only thing I would like to add is a, a huge, uh, gratitude on my behalf of, for Mobius and creating the network, uh, creating the platform and the opportunity for all of us to learn and to learn from each other and, and to be able to work with each other. And I appreciate the opportunity to be a part of that. And thank you for all that you do. You, you do such a professional job at it. And, and I'm, we're honored to be, to be tied with Mobius. Likewise, we appreciate our partnership with you guys. And thank you for the energy this late in the day in the Monday afternoon, not an easy time slot. So we appreciate you. This was a lot of fun. And I know our outside of the questions, we got a lot of positive feedback and reactions from the attendees that were here today. So thank you so much for the time, Chris. We really appreciate you and look forward to more in the future. All right. Thank you, Paige. Have a good evening. You as well. So that being said, guys, wrapping up here really quickly, if you haven't already attended a WOW session, just some brief to go for today. Um, so as a thank you for attending WOW 11, we're pleased to provide all of you with 50% off of any conference past the CBM and Reliability Connect live training conferences. We have two coming up for the rest of this year. We'll be in Monterey, Mexico here in just a few weeks and then in Perth, Australia towards the end of the year. So if you're near either of those two locations, we would love to see you and more to come in 2024. You can find certification opportunities, case study sessions, hands-on workshops, all of that all condensed into wonderful learning programs with the conference. So I hope to see you there. Uh, you can learn more about the conferences at mobiusconnectconference.com. Again, these are live in-person sessions. So hopefully we'll see you there. We'll include more information about those in our follow-up email uh, to today's session. And then coming up tomorrow morning. So Chris was our closer for today. Again, thank you, Chris. Excellent job. Uh, so coming up bright and early tomorrow morning, at least for us here in Eastern time in sunny Fort Myers, Florida, we have the role of the vibration analyst presented by Vamsitter Rao. He is one of our great ambassadors and we're super excited for this session. If you haven't already signed up for Vamsitter's session and you would like to, 
go ahead, log into the attendee hub and just click join session or add to my agenda. You don't need to go any through, through any additional registration steps or anything. You're already signed up. You're already in. So just add it to your own calendars and hopefully you can show up. And if not, the recording similar to Chris's will be available in the on-demand library, which brings me to my final point of today that you guys will be receiving an email from us with access to that on-demand library, which will include all of the WOW 11 sessions, including Chris's here today. And also attached to that email will be your certificate of attendance. So super important. Be on the lookout for that. That's your CEUs. That's your continuing education credits that are valid for industry cert recertification. So be on the lookout for that. And also feel free to share those certificates up on social media, on LinkedIn, tag Allied, tag Chris, tag us, tag Mobius Connect, tag me. We love to see them. We love to support you all along in your continuing education journey. So feel free to share those there. And then if you guys are interested in engaging further with Allied, Chris, other industry professionals, jump up to mobiusconnect.com, join the free community. It's similar to LinkedIn, but specific and customizable to our industry. Um, you can also be sure to follow us on all social media networks at Mobius Connect to stay up to date with the latest community happenings. And then Last but not least, if you guys have any questions whatsoever, feedback about WOW, if you're having technical difficulties with the new platform, if you have suggestions about things you'd like to see in the future, or if you'd like an introduction to Chris and the team at Allied, please reach out to us. Let us know how we can help you. We are here to help you guys and to make your experience the best one possible. So you can reach myself and our Mobius Connect team at info at mobiusconnect.com. Again, don't hesitate to reach out if you guys need anything whatsoever. Otherwise, that does it for us for WOW 11 for day one, guys, in the bank. So we will see you hopefully again in another session this week, hopefully tomorrow morning. Otherwise, stay safe and we will see you next time.